Welcome in to this edition of The Current Report, our weekly roundup of what's happening in the world of digital media. I'm your host, Chris Brooklier. With all the attention made for advertising sites, or MFAs, have received the past few months, it seems like the digital advertising industry is at a crossroads where quality is more important than ever. And as the future deprecation of third-party cookies has the potential to drive down signal, all the data that advertisers can get their hands on is key to determining that quality, which is where a company like Sincera comes in. The ad tech startup headed by CEO Michael Sullivan works to give companies more data on anything from the quality of how their ads are shown on a web page to more insights on what they'll need to build a new product. Say, for example, a tool that detects MFA sites. O'Sullivan and Sincera recently released the Sellers and Publishers Top 100 list in concert with the Trade Desk, and O'Sullivan recently penned an op-ed for The Current. He joins me now. All right. Pleased to be joined by you, Mike. How's it going? Going, doing well. You know, very busy leading up to Cannes and, and all that kind of jazz, but yeah, excited to be here. All right. Excited for you to be here. So Sincera led the the list of the Top 100 Publishers along with the Trade Desk. It seems like there's been a lot of noise that has come out from that list. Have you have you paid attention to kind of what people are saying? Definitely. Yeah, we, we watch a lot of the feedback very closely and we've certainly entered the conversation and, and sort of responded to, to folks who are talking about it. Not everyone, but but many of them. And I think there's sort of different pockets and of where these conversations are happening and the, con- the pockets can have sort of different tones and tenors. And, and what I think is really interesting is a bunch of publishers have reached out directly and the general feedback is like, how do we improve? Like there's a lot of people who say what we don't do well, you know, as an, from an ad experience perspective, but what do we need to do to improve? And that's been super interesting, super fruitful conversations. Yeah. Well, and the, and the next list will come out in about six months, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what I said. We're, we're having some really interesting conversations to, to sort of say like, hey, like help us understand, you know, what's what's the what's the driver on this? And so, you know, to, to use a, a very tactical example, if you're primarily a publisher that does, you know, native display or video um, within a browser, if a lot of your video is running in a sort of an overlay that starts in the middle of the screen and then shrinks down to the bottom right as the user scrolls in the viewport, that's going to have a bunch of different impacts on your score. One, you have ad overlap collisions because the ads are running on top of each other. Two, in many cases, the bid request that's on the outbound specifies a dimension that is not actually the dimension where the, the video ad completes at, right? And then three, a lot of these solutions have full stack pre-bids built into an iframe, which is very weighty, which increases your CPU utilization, which increases your page weight, which increases like slow, slows down and, sl- and makes the page sluggish. That's an example of, you know, one decision that can have impacts across a bunch of different metrics. Um, and so those are the conversations we're, we're talking to with regards to, to publishers on the CTV side. You know, there's certainly conversations about like, you know, what is the, le- what is the bit rate of your creatives? Do you, do you uh, drop creatives? How many creatives are in a pod? Do you have, um, you know, uh, what's the nature of uh, sequencing and exclusion support? Like, you know, do you have like different um, ads running back to back to back or is it the same ad perhaps being seen running back to back to back? So there's there's different metrics in, uh, that are applied to different publishers depending on their supply type. But but generally, yeah, we're, we're having those conversations with, with publishers now. It's really interesting. Yeah, I guess I don't always think of the domino effect that can come from like one specific decision. Mm-hmm. Right? That's, but I think that dovetails into something that I was curious to ask you, though. If we zoom out to like 10,000 feet, just what premium means to you in terms of the, the advertising environment? It's a, it's a tough question what premium means, quite, quite frankly. Um, to me, I think it's all about balance and fairness is what it really comes down to. I think it, I'm, I'm reminded of the conversation. If you take the far end of the premium spectrum and you think about like what has historically been MFA and you say, well, what's MFA? And people are like, oh, I mean, you know, hard to describe it necessarily, but then like, I know it when I see it or it's all paid traffic. And it's like, well, you know, Yahoo engages in paid traffic. Like, are they MFA? It's like, 
No, obviously not. Like, and then like Yahoo Finance is a premium site. It's like, well, what's an example of, well, ads that refresh really fast. It's like, you know, <laughs> six, nine months ago, Yahoo Finance had, you know, display banners that refreshed every 10 seconds. So I tend to think of it like more, less about the label of something being premium or MFA or whatever. And it's more about the behaviors and the balance. Yeah, well, I think I think the MFAs have clearly been one of the big stories from this year in in digital advertising and ad tech, right? And kind of the furor over you know, all of these sites and trying to crack down on them, trying to place them, right? And I th- I think that's also something that you got at in your op ed that was on the current about you know we see viewability as this one metric, but you you can kind of game the system to maybe get the results number wise that you want, but not the results that you want in terms of the, when you see it, you like it type of thing. Right. I think, I think our industry has struggled a lot with the illusion of precision and so, or, or, or the, the limits of what you can measure. So let me give you an example from way back in the day when I worked at Microsoft, when I worked at Microsoft, we, we did this test and it was this ad product. And you may remember it for those have been for those old heads who've been around where you turned on this ad product and it would double underline certain keywords on, on an article page. And if you hovered over it, it was a very aggressive sticky ad product that would come up and maybe pl- play a little video. So if it said like, you know, Nike Cortez in an article, it would like, you know, have a little article autoplay sound on blah, 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 very jarring. And we ran a test. We we're like, okay, we're in one market. We're going to turn this on for Friday. And we observed it. And then you look at the reports and it's like, well, everyone else saw regular traffic and we had a 20% increase in revenue. And it's like, wow. And it was very difficult for Microsoft and MSN at the time to be like, we shouldn't do this because they didn't know how to measure the experience. Right. So it's very tempting to see these types of things, these like low hanging fruit where, Um, Like, you know, because experience and like, I would say like experience over time is so difficult to measure and effectively track, it just often isn't. And then you're comparing that to something immediate, like all of us, I didn't have a video overlay player that's always, that's sticky. And now I do. And now I'm making extra, you know, 10 or $20 million a year. It, It is a challenging problem. And it's this illusion that you're actually measuring you know, apples to apples. And what I mentioned earlier, like the illusion of precision on on this, it's like, you're actually just looking at one side of the equation. And I think why quality in general in the conversation is, is, is at such a crossroads is because there's sort of two waves cresting. Obviously publishers are under immense pressure, particularly like non CTV publishers or non, non video publishers are under immense pressure. So there's more pressure than ever to to experiment and to try these things. And if they drive any ad spend, it's very difficult to turn them off. At the same time, you've got this other wave cresting, which is this idea of fidelity, right? And if you think about historically, DSPs and SSPs, the bid request is atomic. There's no linking of all these different bid requests to say, and this is the ad experience, right? But companies are getting a much richer sense of the ad experience that they're on. So you have these two waves kind of cresting simultaneously, right? The the pressure to increase revenue, the lack of the ability to accurately measure before and after, um, you know, these types of functions that, you you know, uh, maybe I don't love this, but it's driving an immediate rev hit. And your programmatic buyers are, you know, have greater fidelity into understanding the environment. So that's why quality is sort of I would say push to the forefront so much in the in the sort of recent history is is those two waves, those two trends. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing all these future lists and seeing where it goes, and and happy to chat with you today. Yeah, great to chat with you too, Chris. Next, here's our roundup of what's making news across the internet. More details are coming out about the massive media rights deal the NBA is poised to sign. Wall Street Journal reports that ESPN, NBC, and Amazon are in the pole position to pony up $76 billion over 11 years. The latest, though, is the immense investment streaming will get. Half of the games going to NBC will reportedly be streamed exclusively on Peacock. More games will be streamed on ESPN, too, not to mention all the ones that Amazon will stream, making it clear all the parties involved seem to be betting more on streaming for their futures. And finally, we're capping off this episode with one last thing. 
Walled gardens are losing favor with some direct-to-consumer brands, according to a recent story from Adweek. Digital agency Juice said 30 to 40 percent of clients moved to third-party measurement plans in the last year, reportedly motivated by gaining more control over their data and preparing for upcoming privacy changes. Meanwhile, Walled Gardens lost share in the programmatic ad spend market last year for the first time, according to eMarketer, which has been tracking the spend since 2017, and it predicts the trend will continue this year. And that's it for this edition of The Current Report. For a deeper dive on all these stories plus more, check out thecurrent.com. And of course, please like and subscribe on YouTube, plus leave us a review on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you listen. And if you want to hear more from The Current, Listen to The Current Podcast, where we interview some of marketing's biggest leaders about their keystone career moments and where the industry is going next. We'll see you next week.